The resurrection of Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. You don't sound very excited. Mike, um, I saw you recently. You had an interaction on Sean McDowell's uh, YouTube show, YouTube channel show with Dale Allison, who's a Princeton (laughs) theologian and New Testament scholar as well. Do you remember that interaction with Mike? Uh Uh-huh. What is the best evidence for the resurrection? And what is the best case against it? We have two scholars with us today who've both written extensively on this. How would you characterize Dale's position on the resurrection? Who's the first person, just out of curiosity? You don't know Christian apologist Frank Turek? Oh, how I envy you, Dr. Allison. (laughs) Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Though today, I am thrilled to say that we have a current Christian with us to look at the claims of Christians, Dr. Dale Allison. Happy to be here today. We also have this New Testament scholar, Dale Allison, who's written a book also called The Resurrection of Jesus, that I would consider one of the best uh, supports and at times criticisms of the historical case for the resurrection. And Dale's a great guy. He's uh... He's one of the most honest scholars I know. I mean, my scholarship will ever be just a fraction of what his is. He is he is mm. that good. Mm. He is really good. And he has a, good. a new book that's like a year old on the issue, right? Indeed. The Resurrection of Jesus, Apologetics, Polemics, History, is, in my opinion, the most balanced, best-researched book on the resurrection that exists. I can't recommend it highly enough, despite our disagreement about whether the resurrection happened. Link in the description. Longtime viewers of the channel may recall that my use of Dr. Allison's scholarship kicked off my longtime dispute and debate with another scholar. Apologia cited Allison's objection. I've also just taken Dale's brand new course, The Quest for Historical Jesus, which deals specifically with how historians can sort fact from fiction when it comes to claims about Jesus. And they realize there aren't any references to this text at all until maybe the 10th century? I had to pause it several times just to allow my brain some space to adjust to all the new information being poured in. You can get this Princeton-level lecture series for the price of a book at tinyurl.com slash dalejesusquest. But we'll talk about that more later. What we're here for is to get Dr. Allison's insights on the thing he's undeniably the world's foremost expert on. The opinions of Dr. Dale Allison. Jack Jovacona, I think rather unfortunately, referred to Dr. Allison as a fellow believer. What do scholars who might not even be Christians say about the evidence? By the traditional creedal definition of Christianity, uh, Dr. Allison is not in fact a Christian. So for the record, do you consider yourself a Christian? Yes, I do. And I deeply resent people who make such judgments without knowing me personally. I think it's unconscionable. I agree. How would you characterize Dale's position on the resurrection? What does he think actually happened uh, to Jesus's body? I think he thinks Jesus's body returned to life. Mm -hmm. I might misunderstand Dale into some, but I think he thinks Jesus returned to life, that uh, resurrection is an interpretation of Mm -hmm. what happened, Mm -hmm. Um, but that Jesus rose from the dead and there was probably... Perhaps to probably an empty tomb. Yeah, I'm, happy to say, I'm happy to say that I believe in the resurrection. I'm happy to say that I think the tomb was probably empty. But the weird part of me is that I'm not sure those two things, I'm not sure how to connect those two things together. So for me, life after death and victory over the grave aren't going to have anything to do with an empty tomb for anybody else. And so it's really odd for me to know what to do with Jesus's tomb. Okay. I just don't know quite what to to do with it in my own thinking. So when I say, I think the tomb was probably empty, I think I'm really doing that as an historian because I don't, I don't know what to do with it theologically. I'm there, not a traditional Christian. It's just a mystifying thing. I'd be just as happy without it, maybe happier without it. And so the postmodernist kind of view is all of history is just an interpretation. There's, there's little we can know. And there's many challenges to understanding or knowing the past. And I don't think Dale is a postmodernist, but I think he's really influenced some and mm-hmm. it makes him hesitant to, to come to more certain conclusions. Is that fair? No, that's not fair. I am a old fashioned follower of Socrates. 
And Socrates correctly interpreted the oracle of Delphi. The, the wisest person in the world is the person who knows he knows nothing. That's not a postmodern take. That's somebody from the ancient world who's looking around and realizes that things are very complex, very complicated. We have finite minds and we don't understand a lot. And for me, it's actually worse because I'm a Christian, because the concept of God metaphysically is I don't have a grasp of this. And I'm very attracted to apophatic theology. I'm, ap I'm really attracted to the parts of the Christian tradition that are mystical. I'm very attracted to liturgical lines, which refer to mystery. So no, this is not postmodernism. This is, I'd like to think, genuine, traditional, epistemic modesty. It also comes from reflecting upon the fact that I have certain academic hero and people that I admire, and these would include, I don't know, mm -hmm. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Pascal, Gregory of Nyssa, and you could come up into modern times. You could put John Locke. Maybe you want to put Einstein in the room. Aldous Huxley is one of my favorites. William James. You put them in a room and ask, what do they all agree on? So these are my heroes. These are my lights. And they disagree among themselves on absolutely everything. So the notion that I, the sitting here in my little studio, have figured everything out is actually preposterous. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I'm just grasping at, you know, at uh, little pieces. I don't have the whole picture of anything. And this is genuine and heartfelt and has nothing to do with postmodernism. Because I saw in the exchange you had with, with uh, Dale Allison, that Dale was bringing up as an historian, I can't say whether Jesus rose from the dead. And Bart Ehrman will say the same yeah. thing, that you can't say that Jesus rose from the dead because somehow suggesting a supernatural event took place is outside of the realm of history. Yeah. He's saying, look, we could have all this evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. It could be the very best hypothesis to explain the evidence. But as a historian, I don't have the tools to be able to... De to determine it was God because it would require a miracle to, for Jesus to rise from the dead. And so therefore I can't affirm the event itself. Oh, oh, oh. So Mike would say that as an historian, he could say Jesus rose from the dead and the question of agency is then just a theological issue. Yeah, no, I, I as an historian, and as I argue in the book, say that I think that a Christian can look at all the evidence and feel okay and I think that a skeptic can look at all the evidence and feel okay, by which I mean be unmoved, right? Be unmoved to change your mind. So the idea that an atheist could objectively just study history and be converted to the belief Jesus rose the from the dead doesn't make sense to me, uh, even though occasionally someone will say that. And then the other view doesn't make sense to me that you believe in Christianity and then you just read historians and you think purely like an historian and you make a decision that could never have happened. I think other things are always at play here. Philosophical issues are always at play. Social psychology is always at play. Your family history is always at play. Everything's at play and people aren't making pure, pure historical moves. And if they were capable of doing so, I personally don't think from where I stand that they're going to get very far. This is something that neither... Dale nor Bart does. New Testament scholars don't do this. Historians do it, though. They say, if you subject these hypo competing hypotheses to strictly controlled historical method, the hypothesis that best explains the facts. Well, so he has a minimal facts approach. And in the book, I give my reasons why I'm, I'm just not on board with that, right? So I'm not going to say that his conclusion is wrong, but I'm not persuaded by how he gets there, all right? So he does not persuade me. And I'm a sympathetic ear, right? right? I'm not a hostile atheist. I'm not a materialistic skeptic. I'm an open-minded fellow. And it just doesn't win me over. So maybe I'm just a hard-hearted person and things is wrong with me. But I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I remember Bart Ehrman saying this. Um, do you remember what George Bush said in the 2005 State of the Union address? And of course, all of us are going to go, well, of course not. Why would we? And he, he makes that like it's a parallel to uh, the disciples remembering what Jesus said when he was on the earth. How could they write it down? And it's not like Jesus had to come up with a new sermon with every village he went right. in. He may have had 20 sermons. 
Uh-huh. 20 lectures. And he told the same thing over and over and over, and they probably heard the same sermons a hundred times. So Jesus was an itinerant, and I think that view to some extent fits common sense. So what I mean by this is that let's say you're a pastor and you have a congregation and you have to preach every week. You have to do a different sermon every week because you have the same audience. If, however, you are an itinerant and you go from place to place, you can repeat the same material. And in fact, you're probably going to repeat your best material. So that's what I do when I go around from, uh, you know, a church to church or school to school. I don't create some new thing all the time. I rework and use the best stuff that, that I already have. So that makes sense. Problem is, and this is for both sides, a, a skeptic and somebody who's an apologist. If you look at the Gospels, let's say you look at the Last Supper, you've got four accounts of the Last Supper, and they're all clearly accounts of the same event. And they do agree word for word on some things. But the weird thing about them is they don't agree word for word all the way through. They frequently actually disagree with each other. They often get the gist, but they're not agreed word for word. So this is odd to me because it's not memory. It's not memory in the sense that you have memory for a poem. You sit down, you read the lines, and you have the poet, the poem, just as Wordsworth uh, penned it. You don't even have this with the Lord's Prayer. So you have a version in Matthew 6, and you have a version in Luke 11, and they're obviously the same prayer, but they're not word for word identical. So you have this sort of, this weird phenomenon where it's sort of memorization, right? or it's imperfect memorization, or it's loose memorization. It's often more than the gist, but given that there are so many variations, I, I, I always am arguing about the gist or the general sense behind something. I'm never going to put much faith in the exact wording of whatever it is, especially because whatever it is is in Greek, and Jesus probably spoke in Aramaic, right? So right. whatever I have, I've got a translation to start with. So, you know, the truth is, I still don't have the right model for this. I've never found exactly how these things were transmitted. This weird combination of identity and dissimilarity at the same at the same time. But anyway, to, I, I suppose I'm sidetracking here. But going back to Mike's general point, I see no reason to think that Jesus spoke the same thing or the same saying several times, and that it may have differed from time to time. But I don't think that's a really good explanation of the variations in the in the Gospels. So I was raised in the academy or learned this discipline in the 70s and 80s when something called redaction criticism was all the rage. And what that was is what it was looking at the Gospels and on the assumption that one Gospel is using another, trying to figure out the motives for the rewriting and the reordering and everything that's going on and being added. And I think that's, I still think that's the right way to think of these texts. The authors have their own agendas, and it is frequently the case that you can make a good guess as to why the saying is one way in Mark and another way in Matthew. And it's because Matthew is rewriting it according to his own agenda. And that's not because Jesus gave it in one version in Mark and another version in Matthew. It's because Mark has one version, which is the earlier version. And then Matthew has rewritten it. So my tendency when I'm looking at the Gospels is to think in those terms that we've got a lot of literary activity rather than multiple memories of the same saying that Jesus uttered in 10 different forms on multiple occasions. And of course, the example you gave, the Last Supper, isn't even helped by the idea of recurring sermons. Well, so, so no, no, the Last Supper, and by the way, it's like everything else. That is, the Last Supper There was only one Last Supper, and we have four different versions of it. And it strikes me that it's the same phenomenon that you have if you look at Luke 6 or Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So you have a Sermon on the Mount, you have a Sermon on the Plain. Mm -hmm. And you could say, as some people have, well, they're two different sermons. Jesus gave them on two different occasions. My own view is that if you start with Luke 6, you can figure out pretty much everything in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 on the basis of knowing Matthew's agenda, his editorial work and so on. I think he's taken what he knows from Luke 6, and he's merged it and added to it other things. But I don't think there are two sermons, right? So in the past, I've been criticized for utilizing your arguments 
against the value of the 500 witnesses. Now, if you just look at this clip, you would think that, well, Ellison uh, disagree. Now, it, it seems that Ellison disagree right, about uh, the 500. Actually, uh, according to Ellison, we, we don't know what kind of experience they had, but Ellison does think that there were this group of people. Is it wrong for a skeptic like me to use your scholarship on individual points, even if we disagree on our conclusions? No, 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 no. So, so I think I, I think everybody's wrong if they use me as an authority or a support. All that matters is my arguments or my reasoning. So ad hominem stuff doesn't carry any weight and should it, and appealing to authority or consensus should carry no weight. All that should carry weight is the force of the argument. And when it comes to the 500s, yeah, First Corinthians 15, I just think I'm obviously right. I'm just obviously right. And that's it. So I, I think, you know, it's not that, you know, you could cite Allison and he spent, you know, 25 years thinking about this verse and this is what he's done. It's rather, he just makes some common sense observations and I think he's right. So if that's what you're doing, then yeah. I, I, okay, I'm vindicated now. So your conversation with Mike didn't just ruffle Frank's feathers. You also drew some ire from Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, and by extension, the McGrews. So I think if I was a skeptic, the, the best, your best bet is to cast doubt on the Gospels and Acts actually being grounded in eyewitness testimony. And of course, Dale okay. Allison does that in his book, and other skeptics do that. I actually found in Dale Allison's book, um, on page 714, he actually briefly alludes to the maximal data approach. He says, because uh, the maximal data approach, of course, was pioneered and developed by Tim and Lydia McGrew. And Allison spends a good bit of time insisting that, that we really don't know what we're talking about. I don't remember doing that. I've read a couple of articles by her, I think, maybe three articles. I think maybe they were all co-authored with her husband. Yeah, and Tim, I yeah. comment on one of them. But it had to do with their use of Bayesian analysis, their use of, of mathematics with reference to the and, and probability with reference to resurrection. But I don't recall interacting with her in any other way. But let's go, so look, I, I need to add a qualification. I've done a lot of podcasts. And I'm a 67-year-old man whose memory is imperfect. Now, Allison's argument that we can know nothing about Jesus' ontological status after his resurrection and that visionary experiences better fit the data, that argument is based in no small part on the fact that he really does think there's a lot of embellishment and overlay in the gospel narratives. Yeah. I don't know of any other work that historians unilaterally say this work as a whole is reliable or unreliable. So if that's where you want to put the Gospels, for me, that's that's the first case in history where someone's saying, well, this document is just reliable across the board. Like that doesn't seem like a thing that a historian would say. It doesn't matter to me what historians in fact do. What matters to me is what they ought to do. Right? And so in this, in this case, I'd say this is good historical practice. I mean, a similar um, thing in, in scholarship that I used to often strongly disagree with is the disdain for harmonization, which I think is a very good historical practice. And so regardless of whether scholars like to harmonize, uh, I think they should like to harmonize. And so I, I completely, uh, it doesn't impress me to say scholars do this or don't do that. What impresses me was what an argument for what they ought to be doing. And I think that treating them in this manner is good historical practice. You, you disagree with how historians treat history on this point. Now that's the that's a whole presupposition of the so-called quest for the historical Jesus. So it, once you assume that Jesus existed and that the sources have a few things to say about him, and you don't think that they are inerrant or infallible and you're not a harmonizer who you know can put everything together, then you have to ask the historical question. And for me, there, there are just obvious things. So you have to choose at points between the Gospel of John, I think, and the, the synoptics. And sometimes you have to choose between the synoptics or different versions of, of a particular event or a saying. So it's never, for me, it's never all of, or nothing. That doesn't compute. And I don't know anybody. I'm trying to think. I'm, I mean, you know, if you start with Paulus and you, you think of Strauss or Schweitzer or Bultmann or Jeremias or Dodd or... E.P. Sanders or John Dominic Cross and whoever it is, they're all looking at the whole and they're presuming that it is not picture perfect history, but they are also assuming that there are historical memories in here. So the question is, 
How do we distinguish what's true from what's false, what's memory from what's not memory, and so on and so on? I, I personally think that's an exceedingly complex and difficult subject, and I think that we we've, we've made it too easy on ourselves. I think often fact and fiction mixed together. I think often memory is put within imaginary scenes. I think it's a really messy, difficult thing to sort out. But it's the idea that it's all or nothing would mean, I suppose, I wasted my entire life. It's often pointed out that uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 adds his own appearance in, in verse 8 to the other appearances. And since Paul's appearance seems to have been vision-like, then on what basis do we say that the other uh, apostles did not have similar vision-like experiences. Um, and that would, of course, be Dale Allison's interpretation of the resurrection encounters, that they were vision-like experiences rather than physical encounters with the risen Jesus. But I think that the most decisive way of um, making this argument is to point out that, and to argue for it, the proposition that Luke was a traveling companion of the apostle Paul. Then it'd be very surprising if Luke's concept of the nature of the supposed appearances to the apostles were radically different from that of Paul's. I'm one of the scholars who thinks that Paul could not have just said, Jesus appeared to me, end of sentence, I never want to talk about it again. If he had an encounter, I am sure that he verbalized it to himself and that he verbalized it to others. And it's my own conviction that whether the author of Luke heard from Paul himself or whether he heard from somebody who had heard from Paul or whether he heard from people at a church that Paul had been at, whatever it was, or more likely he'd heard more than one version of this story, that the three stories in Acts probably go back in gist or essence to a narrative, an autobiographical narrative of Paul himself. All right. But again, I wouldn't want to mine the details for anything there. Uh, I wrote an article several years ago in JBL, Journal of Biblical Literature, in which I argued that Luke has a tradition here, and I tried to reconstruct it in part. And then I argued that it was congruent with some things in Paul. But I'm still not going to push the details of the narrative. I just, the narratives don't even agree about the, you know, among themselves. So, you know, there's that old conundrum, the people who are with Paul, they, they see something but don't hear anything. But in another account, they hear something and don't see anything. People try to harmonize those things. I just think Luke made a boo-boo, and I have no idea which way it was in his source, and that's it. And what, once you see things like that, you're just not going to push the details, right? You're just not going to do that. Excellent. Well, let's switch gears to talk about your new course. It's eight lectures, high-definition video, great sound, expertly edited, but more importantly... It's Princeton-level material that I personally have just not seen elsewhere. Now, when we think of Luther and Calvin and the Reformers, we don't think of skeptics. But they were skeptics big time. Given their doctoral convictions, Martin Luther and the other Reformers looked at stories of miracles and stories of saints and stories about Mary, and they had to say they're all bunk. They had to disprove them. So they argued against visions of Mary. They argued against healings at shrines. They argued against Eucharistic miracles. They argued against statues moving. Now, if you're a Protestant, this seems, again, from our time and place, no big deal. This is a major event in history, and this is really the birth of skepticism writ large. People always talk about David Hume and his doubting of miracles and how important he is. In my judgment, he's the direct descendant of Martin Luther. Okay, so I think that the so-called quest for the historical Jesus really got started because of Enlightenment skepticism regarding miracles. So the big question, in the 18th century and then the early part of the 19th century and then on into the middle of the 19th century is, well, if we don't believe in miracles anymore, if Hume, for example, is right and we're all sophisticated German people or modern people, we don't do that anymore. How on earth do you explain the gospels? Because they are full of miracle stories. So the quest gets underway by people saying, how do we explain these texts? Because there are parts of them that we no longer can, can believe in. But part of the contribution of that lecture, and it's something that I don't think people pay enough attention to, is that the Enlightenment skepticism 
is genealogically a, a direct descendant of the Protestant skeptics. So when Protestants appeared on the scene and had debates with Catholics, Catholics would defend Catholicism in part by appealing to this rich tradition of Roman Catholic miracles, visions of Mary, moving statues, healing relics, shrines where people were healed, and, and so on and so on, tons and tons of, of miracle stories. And the Protestants could not accept those miracle stories because the common presupposition, which I think should have been questioned but never was, was that these stories vindicate Roman Catholic theology. Mm, yeah. Protestants had to sit back and come up with reasons to reject these stories. And they rejected them in total. That is, they decided it was all legendary or hallucinatory or folklore. They came up with the earliest ways of explaining away these stories. And what you end up getting with a number of early Protestants, especially Reformed Protestants, is the notion that miracles ceased in the first century. That's eventually the view you get. And what happens is once you get the wars of religion and people become becoming disillusioned and you have anti-clericalism and so on, it's natural for people who want to reject Christianity to pick up the arguments of the Reformers against all the medieval miracles and say, these all apply equally well to the Bible. So let's just get rid of all miracles. I personally think Hume is the climax of that tradition. I think in some weird way, Hume is the uh, logical conclusion of Luther. He's not usually thought of that way, but th there's a cessationist, what's called a cessationism, that's the view mm -hmm. that miracles are gone. There's a cessationist tradition, a direct tradition, genealogy, I think, from the first reformers. To, to Hume. And then once you have Hume, then in a, in a climate where you don't want miracles to happen, and then at some point within certain parts of the academy, it's just assumed that miracles don't happen anymore, then you've got to figure out the Gospels. And that's, that's really where it starts. So I think you, you have to understand all of that history to know why all of a sudden in the middle of you know, the 18th century, you start getting people writing in very critical ways as they do about the Gospels. So about half the people watching this are Christians and the other half skeptics. What will each side get out of this? Well, first of all, I think I, I find that tons of people still, even non-religious people, seem to have an interest in Jesus. They're, you know, he's one of the figures of history, or at least people have turned him into one of the great figures of history. And it's just natural to know about people. I'm interested in Abraham Lincoln, and people are interested in these outsized historical figures. So he is one of those figures. For Christians, obviously, there, there is the issue of what to make of the Gospels and how to read the Gospels and whether we've learned anything about the Gospels that's helpful in the last two or three centuries. I personally think that we've learned a lot about the Gospels and that if you're going to read them, study them, use them, preach them, theologize from them, uh, it would be inane not to pay attention to all the things that we have learned in recent times. I think it's an intrinsically fascinating subject. I think he's a fascinating historical figure. And for Christians, I, I also I don't think you can understand the Christian theological landscape in the last three centuries without understanding what's going on here. Modern liberal theology grows directly out of all these debates about the historical Jesus. And then everything that liberal, liberal, let's say liberal Protestant German 19th century theology in turn influences, it's all coming out. It's all coming out of this. Based on your previous scholarship, I'm assuming that both camps are going to have plenty to be affirmed, plenty to be challenged, and they'll probably both be angry with you. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say, yeah. I'm always in the middle, all alone. <laughs> but I got used, I got used to it. My wife loves me. I do as well. At least your scholarship. And I know my viewers will get so much out of this course. Available now at tinyurl.com slash dalejesusquest. And if you use that link, you'll be supporting this channel. So thank you very much for that. Dr. Allison, thank you so much for your time. Anytime. Uh, thanks. This was fun. For more investigation into Jesus' resurrection and the claims of Christians, tap on the thumbnail on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Take care. Bye-bye. Later.